uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 22, and that's on page 1076 of your Pew Bibles. Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you can inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, and he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their request. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who will harm you if you are passionate for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed, but set apart the Messiah as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping your consciences clear, so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God after being put to death in the fleshly realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. In that state, he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient, when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while an ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that he's gone into heaven, he's at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. The right side of history. Uh, Most of us have heard that quote. Uh, In fact, it's a quote that's been bandied about a lot in Australia in the last few years. Uh, It was a quote that was trundled out in the same-sex marriage referendum. If you've been paying attention to the campaign on the voice referendum, you'll have heard the right side of history. Uh, We've seen it trotted out for everything from the fight against slavery through to the development of women's sport. Go the Matildas. I think the phrase has a number of problems. But it works as a phrase by suggesting that people might miss out that their way of thinking and their way of living is somehow deficient or less than desirable. Uh, In a modern society, it can cause people to experience FOMO, fear of missing out. And on a deeper level, it can cause people to raise questions about the wisdom of a certain lifestyle or moral or theological decisions. The right side of history Now, as Peter finishes examining the practice of God's mob that shows the substance of the proclamation of God, he wants to turn to a phrase like that and talk about life as God's community. And we're going to look at that in a moment. Let me pray, and then we're going to dive in. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, we could just read your word, and its living and active nature applied by your spirit would change us because it is the revelation of your very self, who you are, what you desire, and what you have done. Our Father, as we think about your word today, please apply it to us. Please help us to feel its active edge, and please use it to transform our lives so that in this town we are a living, breathing example of who you are, so that others can come and call you Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Peter's laid out the identity of God's mob. Uh, They're a rejoicing mob. They have a certain future. They call God Father. They're temporary protection visa holders in the world. They're aliens on a journey. Uh, Peter's outlined their proclamation, what they're saying to the world. Hey, hey, look at God. Look at Jesus. Jesus. 
How good are they? They have given us life. And now Peter's been encouraging God's mob to practice that proclamation because the practice shows the substance, the truth, the reality of the proclamation. And Peter understands the tension God's mob experience. Remember, they're scattered right throughout what we know as modern-day Turkey. They live in isolated communities, perhaps even just as individuals or households in their town. They live under the Roman Empire, who brooks no opposition. Peter understands that tension for God's people. Uh, And in this section, uh, Peter's outlined the practice of the proclamation in three areas of life, in politics, household labour, and in marriage. And he's exhorted God's people to be honourable, to conduct themselves in such a way that they display the nature of God and the nature of Jesus. Uh, In each of those areas, there's a real spiritual eternal consequence, not least being introducing others to the goodness of God. This is the last of those practice areas. And in this area, in verses 8 to 22, Peter turns to what life looks like as a mob, as a community, as God's people live together and how they relate to the world around them. Uh, Look there in verse 8. I'm at point 2 on the outline. Now, finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers and be compassionate and humble. All of you. All of you. He's talking to all of God's mob, and he outlines the attributes that build the community up, that don't tear it apart. Uh, Look at those attributes again there in verse 8. Very hard to have or exhibit or display any of them when you're living as an individual. They're all communal. They're all social. They're all relational. It's the description of a mob building itself up. There's a unity in thinking which considers each other but exhorts each other to focus on the big picture of practising and proclaiming the goodness of God. There's a sacrificial love that exists in a community sharing and exhorting and encouraging and rebuking, always with kindness, always with humility. I'm familiar with a number of community organisations in town. Many of them have a charter or a constitution. None of them list these as attributes for that community. Only this community is defined in this way. Only this community is constituted and built up in this way. And if it consistently and coherently practices this, this community will stand out and it will attract a lot of attention. Look there in verse 9. Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you can inherit a blessing. One of the consistent themes through Peter's letter to God's mob in modern-day Turkey is that you're going to be different. (laughs) Just deal with that reality. You're going to be different. You're going to stand out if you proclaim and practice consistently. There'll be a tension brought to you. There'll be a response, often harsh with, with some enmity, often with rejection, perhaps even some suffering. And you'll need to practice your proclamation in response. Very hard not to see the template of Jesus from verses 21 to 25 here. Very hard to miss it. Insults and evil are not responded to. In In fact, how are God's mob to respond? Did you see that there in verse 9? Giving a blessing to those who insult them giving a blessing to those who persecute them. That's remarkable, isn't it? A blessing in the Greek is literally two thumbs up and approval. Can you imagine that being your first port of call when someone doles out evil towards you? You respond by approving them? Now, notice we're not being told here to approve their behaviour. What I think we are being told to do here 
is to respond to them as someone who has value before God and who's been made in God's image. Someone for whom Jesus came for, approving them in their humanity. And it's an expression of grace and kindness that shows the identity of our Father. In fact, it would be very hard to live as God's mob, to proclaim and practice consistently, expecting his kindness and blessing on the last day if we didn't do that now as God's people. Why would we expect to be blessed by God on the last day if we refuse to exhibit the same blessing as we dealt with the community around us? Even closer to home, that's how God's mob are to live amongst themselves. Not trading insult for insult, not trading evil for evil, always quicker to bless each other than to tear each other down. And God's mob have always been like that. And that's why Peter quotes from Psalm 34. Look there in verses 10 through 12. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their request, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Have you noticed how often Peter quotes Psalm 34? Chapter 2, verse 3, we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. It's lurking there behind verses 9 and 10. Uh, He uses it here to say this is how God's mob have always been. Uh, Nothing new here. This is how God's mob have always existed, how they've always lived in a world that rejects God. God's mob always speak openly, honestly, transparently with each other. God's mob always trade in truth, never deceit. God's mob pursue peace, not division and not evil. God's mob live always in light of the very God they call Father, trusting that he has their best interests at heart. I want us to grasp how unique such a community is. There's no other mob like it in the whole world. And the assurance there in verse 12 is that God is for his people and he's against those who don't practice the proclamation even in his people. And so God's mob have a reasonable expectation. Point three on the outline. Look there in verse 13. Who'll harm you if you're passionate for what is good? That's a reasonable statement, isn't it? Uh, If you're passionate for what is good, if you're passionate about practising the proclamation that God and Jesus are enough, it's reasonable to expect no suffering, isn't it? (laughs) Because you're practising good stuff. Uh, In fact, in the long run, that's what will happen. And really important here to notice how Peter keeps reminding us subtly, consistently, Uh, that we think in the long run, don't we? Because ultimately you won't suffer for being passionate about good on Judgment Day, will you? You'll avoid harm because you've actually been consistent in your proclamation and practice. That's reasonable. The reality is, well, look at verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. Uh, One's a reasonable expectation The other one is dealing with the world around you, a world that's rejected God. And so there is suffering for serving God. In fact, you notice how that's described? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, what are you? You're blessed. You're approved by God. God says two thumbs up. And we'll come to that in a moment. But it does raise a question. It does raise the question, how are you going to respond to that? Now, we've had a hint of that, haven't we, up there in verse 9? Don't pay back evil for evil. But now Peter actually expands a little further. When you do suffer, because it's going to happen for being God's people, how will you respond honourably? Look there in verse 14a. Don't fear what they fear or be disturbed, but set apart the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defence to anyone who asks you 
for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. Get your fears straight. (laughs) That's the first way to deal with it, isn't it? And that's why we had that quote from Isaiah 8. God's mob are in a real tears because they've got a whole lot of armies bearing down on them. Ahaz, the king at the time, is running around like a headless chicken. Isaiah, the prophet, is trying to calm him down. And God speaks to Isaiah and says, Isaiah, just relax. Get your fear straight. Get your fear straight. What do you fear, Isaiah? What do you fear, God's people? Is there the fear of missing out? the fear of an opportunity lost, the fear of standing out, the fear of not appearing to be liked or having it all together, get your fear straight. Who or what do you truly fear? Well, there's only one to fear, isn't there? That's God alone. And when you understand that, you realise not only is he to be feared, but he can be trusted. And he'll provide sanctuary for his mob. So as these people persecute you, as they mutter about you, as they insult you, first get your fear straight. Second, get your boss straight. Uh, Do you see that down there in verse 15? Who's your boss? Who's your Lord? Is it the whim and the wind of the world around you? (laughs) Is it the fear of an opportunity lost or the current trends or the socially acceptable opportunities? Or is it Jesus, the one that we consistently go around saying, he's my Lord and Saviour? Get your fear straight, get your boss straight, get your answers straight. Do you see that there in verse 15? Always be ready. Why would you make that decision? Why do you trust in Jesus? Why do you think he's not dead and alive? Why do you actually look to the future? Why do you say there's a judgment day? Well, why do you do that? Well, be ready to give an answer. An answer that proclaims how good God is. And when you do, get your tone right. Get your fear straight. Get your boss straight. Get your answer straight. Get your tone right. Do you see that there in verse 16? Do it with gentleness and respect. It's the same tone as... Bless those who persecute you. Don't be defensive. Don't be aggressive. Don't be whining. Be gentle, respectful, knowing that the one you're speaking to is made in the image of God. Ultimately, in the long run, if God's people respond that way as they inevitably suffer, do you notice what happens there in verse 16? Those who denounce your life will be what? Put to shame (laughs) because your proclamation and practice are seen to have substance. And notice how he summarises it there in verse 17, for it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Now, here's the sticking point, isn't it? Because we we can assent to everything we have heard so far, but here he's actually gone, that life of suffering for doing good That's the better life. That's the life on the right side of history. Do we actually think that? Do we actually go, yeah, I agree with him. It is better to suffer for doing good. Or deep down in our hearts, do we go, actually, am I missing out here? I'm actually on the wrong side of history. Have I actually made a wrong decision here and backed the wrong horse? And Peter saw the same question in his days. God's mob were isolated. Uh, do you notice his response? Verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God after being put to death in the fleshly realm and made alive in the spiritual realm. Uh, what's the most important word there? For. For. It connects this verse to the previous, saying here's the evidence that that's the better life. 
suffering for doing good. Because uh, let's look at Jesus. Jesus himself suffered for doing good. Had he done any evil? Notice there, he's described as righteous. Who did he suffer for? Everyone else in the whole universe. He was without sin. He experienced the ultimate suffering, taking our sins upon himself. And that means he brings people like us to God so that we can be restored, remade and forgiven. Have you ever heard anyone say Jesus could have had a better life? There's a bloke who practiced the proclamation and gives us the example of the best life, suffering for doing good. Not because he was neglected by God, but because he trusted that God was every bit as good as he'd said. Jesus was blessed and raised from the dead. It's a better life. But notice that he's more than just an example here. He's actually the substance for why we can look forward to being on the right side of history. Now, we're going to quickly look at verses 18 to 22 again. As we do, let me read to you a quote from Martin Luther, which will explain my confusion. Martin Luther says, This is a strange text, and certainly a more obscure passage than any other passage in the whole of the New Testament. I still do not know for sure what Peter means. So as we look at this, just keep that in the back of your minds, okay? Keep that in the back of your minds. But these verses give us great confidence that we'll actually be on the right side of history. Now let's just work through them very quickly. Verse 18, Jesus' death was in the world. He died in the world and he was raised in the world. He was raised as someone who was magnificent, who was seen as eternally powerful. And in his resurrection, he showed that he had no opposition, not even death could beat Jesus. In that state, Physically raised from the dead, glorious and set for all of eternity. In that state, Jesus says to the whole world, hey, let me tell you who I am. I'm the boss. No one else has walked out of the tomb. Everyone else has been beaten by sin. When Jesus proclaimed that, he proclaimed it to everything in the universe, the natural, the supernatural, the living and the dead. And now in verse 22, he is seated at the right hand of God with no rival. He reigns supreme over everything, past, present and future. And it's at that point that Peter then turns to Noah and not the obvious choice, to reassure his readers and us. In Noah's day, Noah was subjected to ridicule. What, what did Noah do for a 100 years? He built a boat in the middle of the desert. What a fool. And as he built the boat in the middle of the desert, what was he telling all of his neighbours? There's a really big flood coming that's going to wipe out the universe. Even more of a fool. And yet when the flood came, Moses, Noah was seen to be on the right side of history, wasn't he? How, how many were saved on that day? Eight. <laughs> Small number, insignificant, but they were saved. And, and, and Peter's saying to his readers there, your situation's just the same. What a bunch of fools. Small in number, trusting in God, Proclaiming and practicing something that looks ridiculous, but relying on God's promise to save them. Relying on God to do exactly as he says. And Peter says, baptism reminds you of that. Baptism is a pledge, a promise, a sign. Using a similar element, water, a baptism saves you. Yes, I did just say that. Baptism saves you as a sign that you rely on God to do as he promised. God is good for it. 
And you just have to look at the cross and the empty tomb to see it. It was effective for Noah because he obeyed God and trusted in him. It's effective for us and it will place us on the right side of history. I'm at the last point on the outline. Uh, Living as God's mob in this world uh, will make us stand out. We will look different. We'll be described as odd, strange. In times we'll even be described as offensive. There are many instances over the last hundreds of years where God's people have been told that they are on the wrong side of history. Get with the times. Fit in. Stop holding on to such dated beliefs. From the inside, we can sometimes wonder whether this really is the better life and whether we'll actually be on the right side of history one day. But we've just seen that we will be, won't we? Why? Because look at Jesus. He's on the right side of history. He's beaten death. He's enthroned above everyone. And this life works because he has achieved it for us. In the long run, God's mob will be on the right side of history. But what will that look like tomorrow? Let me just quickly wrap it up. You'll see four suggestions on your outline. This is what being on the right side of history looks like tomorrow. First, God's mob exists as a certain type of community. There is no other community like this in town. Yet we are an odd bunch. We are strange because of the Lord we serve. But this community is strange. It's transparent. It's humble. It pursues peace. It is like-minded. It says that Jesus is enough and that God is good. It says that if we trust in them, there is an eternal future. Do we actually exist like that? Are we so like-minded, so like-minded that we actually make sure we're on the same page that the issue at hand is God's goodness for the salvation of sinners? Are we such a transparent and honest community? Is deceit and slander and insult not found on our lips? Do we actually speak truth to each other and pursue peace? Second, God's mob are to make a certain type of defence. You will face opposition and you'll have to answer for what you proclaim and practice. Jesus is Lord and Saviour. We trust in him. Do we actually make that defence? individually and corporately? Or do we spend all of our lives undermining our defence by not matching our practice and proclamation? Does our mere existence in this town offer Jesus to those around us? Jesus and him alone. God's mob, thirdly, have a certain type of perspective. Our perspective on life has two bookends, Jesus coming and Jesus returning, what he achieved here and what he will reveal then. Everything we exist in now, we understand between that. We know history's going somewhere. History doesn't repeat itself. History moves somewhere. And so we work out our fear in life in light of that. What does our practice reveal? Do we actually fear the eternal consequences of heaven and hell? Or do we just fear the temporary discomforts of today? Do we fear the one who's conquered death? Or do we fear social death? Do we fear the lost opportunity of an eternity with Jesus as much as we fear the lost job, the lost social invitation, the lost social occasion? Do we fear the lost opportunity to practice what we proclaim? Or do we fear the fact that we might lose face in our town? Finally, God's mob have a certain type of confidence. God's mob don't swagger. God's mob don't boast. God's mob don't suffer FOMO. God's mob are not aggressive or defensive. God's mob are just confident. Jesus is enthroned, we practice what we proclaim and because of him we'll be on the right side of history. Let me pray. Father, we've covered a huge amount 
Uh, It's hard to stay focused with all of this stuff coming at us. But, Father, remind us of this truth to practice what we proclaim, that you are enough, and that to understand this is to understand history rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. What's your question, mate? I was just asking if it was we had time for questions and you've just launched in. First time we struggled with in my Saviour of the week. Sadie Martin Luther. Verse 19, in that state, he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in the past were disobedient. Yeah, flog a dog, hey? Uh, It's a tricky one. Uh, uh, Let me just say there's a lot of this sermon that ended up on the cutting room floor, so be thankful for that, okay? Uh, There is a book called One Enoch, which was an extra-biblical book going around at the time. It's also quoted in 2 Peter and Jude, quoted explicitly in Jude, that talks about this. It's kind of like one of those books that's good but not revelation. You know, kind of like a J.C. Ryle book or a John Stott book. Uh, And in that it talks about this kind of instance. Uh, But I think the best understanding comes from verse 18. After being put to death in the fleshly realm and made alive in the spiritual realm. So let's get that clear. Uh, Jesus was put to death in the realm of sin and rebellion against God but made alive in the eternal kingdom of God. So it's not, it both were physical and bodily. It's not saying the soul matters more than the body, but when he was physically raised from the dead, in that state, as Jesus ascended to heaven, he made a public proclamation to everyone, living, dead, those already with God, those already in hell, supernatural, natural. Jesus made a declaration, I'm the boss of the universe. Okay, I'm the Lord, and the resurrection proves that. One of the really interesting things in 1 Peter is how significant the resurrection is, but I think it's as simple as that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 